everyone, and welcome to Golf's Next Gen, the official podcast of the American Junior Golf Association. My name is Tim Jackman. That is Thomas Harrison. And back there behind the computer is producer Justin. So we're going to get going with episode three of the podcast. We have a great guest coming up in Yana Wilson, an extremely decorated junior golfer. She has quite a few wins and top finishes and just all around has some awesome experiences in golf so far in her very young career. But before we get to that, I think we have a lot of things to talk about. But Thomas, why don't you start with uh, what you brought to the table today? Yeah, so something that's been rent free in my head over the last couple of days, something I'm sure everyone has seen by now. Uh, but after winning the Zurich, our uh, songbird of the generation taking the stage to sing some karaoke <laughs> and Rory McIlroy, um, it just got me thinking, Tim, you know, as a quite the decorated golfer yourself. <laughs> If you were to go out there and win a PJ Tour event, you have to get up on stage. What song are you singing for the people? Oh, see, this is a, this is an interesting one because there are a couple songs that I really like that I love to sing, but I can't sing. First of all, but I think I'd probably have to go with "Party in the USA" by Miley Cyrus. And the reason I say that is because the words of that song are extremely easy to understand. It just repeats itself like eighteen times, so it's so much easier to do that in front of like a crowd of people. Like I'll do this, sit down and do this all the time, but getting up there and, and trying to perform in front of people like that. Mm. Not a karaoke guy. Not. I think I can you can host on, a podcast. But you can't say. <laughs> I can count on one hand how many times I have done karaoke, and one of them was basically forced. That's so, uh, take it as you. You are no stranger to karaoke, though. No, I'm a big yeah, I think fan you do karaoke in your apartment. Uh, we do have the karaoke machine. No stranger to a good old karaoke night. Um, I mean, how can you not love it? It's it's just a great. When you time can't all sing, you don't love it. <laughs> See, well, maybe we get you some vocal lessons. You hit the range, <laughs> see a vocal coach. We'll get you in tip-top shape. I need to hit the range, but it's not the vocal range. <laughs> that was another dad joke for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what would you choose? Your, your father of three is showing. But, <laughs> uh, no, I think if you know me, you know there's probably two songs right away. One, Lips of an Angel by Ender, obviously. <laughs> um, Got to show off the vocal range. Um, and two is All the Small Things by Blink-182. Uh, wow. Just crowd pleasers everyone knows them they get the people going uh again it's all about being a showman out there so you got to give the people what they want can we get a- i respect party in the usa <laughs> it's so easy can we get can we get a little sample you can give us you would you know the voice is gone from the night's <laughs> game give me, give me a few weeks we'll uh, we'll get it going <laughs> <laughs> well uh, interesting i did see rory's performance and it was it was quite moving so i think i i think he gained a lot of new fans uh with that one so Interesting. Mine's not nearly as fun, what I brought, um, but it is pretty interesting. Um, if you saw um, last week or, or I guess a week and a half ago by the time this gets published, but uh, Frankie Sappin uh, put in a 58 at the at the Corn Ferry event, the Veritex uh, Bank Championship in Texas, which I thought was interesting. Frankie actually won our Puerto Rico event in 2016, which I happened to, to be at and is really cool. His mom's great. Uh, but he actually broke Scotty Scheffler's course record at that course, which was pretty cool. And so I got, I got kind of curious about a bunch of low rounds on, especially in the corn Ferry tour. And it was, it was really interesting because there's a lot of controversy around low rounds in golf and it's, you can go on Wikipedia or wherever and you can see a bunch of these low rounds that people have supposedly put in, but golf being the way it is, it's really hard to verify. Like I saw a couple of 55s by like random guys at golf courses that uh, Guinness world records recognizes, but it's like when you see the scramble team come in, <laughs> 48, you're like, okay, sure. A couple of foot wedges, I think, there. But I think what was what was really interesting, so I started looking up some of the Corn Ferry ones and then in, like, pro golf and competition. Um, there was a 57 that was shot just this year alone. Um, Cristobal del Solar, he shot a 57. And then also Aldrich Pulskeiter, um, who, interestingly enough, was a Junior President's Cup participant a couple years ago. He actually shot a 59. So there's a couple of really low sub-60 scores just this year. Um, but those last two scores, and if I have a little bit of an asterisk, which is this is kind of part of what makes this kind of a controversial topic, is that they were um, par 70 golf courses um, that they were playing, and they were played at 6,200 yards, um, so professional. So really interesting to see 
those scores and kind of how they how they get recognized. Uh, but there's a ton of other ones out there if you start looking at competition. I mean, Bobby Wyatt shot um, in 2010 at the Alabama Boys Junior Championship, shot a 57 in competition. Um, so I looked at our records, um, which is kind of another thing. And, and again, more controversy because you count – the low number, like the low total of strokes, or do you count low to par? So um, that we have two 60s in, uh, on the boys' side in agency competition, which was minus 11. We also have two 61s that are minus 11. So it's like, which one of those is really the lower score? And then on the girls' side, we have three different 62s that were minus 11. So kind of an interesting how you look at things there depends on your definition of lowest scores. Yeah. I think that's one of the things about golf that is really intriguing to people is it's really hard to define things like that. Um, Cause I know like you talked about not just a par or the yardage, but I believe Del Solar's part of the controversy, at least online was it was played at a bit of elevation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 80, almost two mile and a half. Yeah. So like playing 6,200 yards at elevation um, obviously is a little bit of a question. But I think that's part of what makes golf fun and why it's so cool to see those scores is because there's nothing that's stopping just the average person from going out and using that top quality equipment. I'm not going to say it's the same equipment, but um, that top equipment, they can play that same yardage on those same courses and see where they stack up. And obviously a lot of sports, you can't do that. It's not like you are just going to (laughs) go stand in the batter's box and see 102 and just try to take that deep. But um, you know, certainly interesting. I know, speaking of elevation, I think one of my favorite um, AJJ stories from my time here, I don't know if you remember Johnny Clark, um, another Junior Presidents Club Cup team member um, now at Oklahoma State. But Johnny Clark, if you've ever seen him hit a golf ball, it just sounds different. That kid yeah. can hammer a golf ball. Um, so I believe he was, I think he was out in Colorado. Um, there was a par four, was about 340, 350. Um, he sends his first tee shot OB. So he just reloads on the tee, hits the drive to about three feet, and taps in for par. <laughs> and it was one of those things that just hearing about it was incredible, but I can't even imagine seeing something like that, um, especially from a junior golfer. But that's one of those things where, you know, it brings into question a lot of those things of scores, elevation, yardage, things like that. Yeah, it's so – this. There's just so many nuances to it. Like, no two courses are exactly the same. No two conditions are exactly the same. None of that stuff. But I do like your what you mentioned with being just anybody being able to do it. I mean, I could go out here to the golf course we have outside the office, and I would never shoot a 62. But, you know, I theoretically, I could shoot a 62, right? right? Like, no, it, it, could, <laughs> it could happen. Shout out new QI10, though. Haven't hit it yet. But, I told you it's so good. <laughs> but, yeah, you could do it, so. Okay, well, good. I, I feel like those were a couple of good things. A lot of other stuff going on. Nelly just continuing to go on her tear. I mean, insane. What she's doing is incredible. It's it's one of those things where, like, she comes into the final round in second place, and it's just you've accepted it's over. Yeah. Like, you know she is so dialed right now. There's just not a question. I don't think anyone on the tour has any question about it. I think they see her in that spot on the leaderboard, and they think, like, oh, well, here we go again. You know, like, what – what are we supposed to do about it? Um, because it certainly doesn't look like she's slowing down anytime soon. Yeah. And just, really just a down, down to earth human really loves giving back to through obviously her junior tournament. But I don't, I don't know if you've seen on social media, like also really loves dogs and like, there's a really a big dog shelter that she's a, a huge part of. And she, the Monday after she won the Chevron, she had posted a picture of just hanging out <laughs> at the dog shelter. So it was really cool to see, see her do that and kind of what, what she enjoys doing and, kind of giving back so pretty phenomenal um what she's been able to accomplish and i mean i can't remember too many big runs like this that have been as as impactful as that through a major through some of these other events that she's done it through and just the viewership that she's bringing with it too i mean um winning at the chevron getting her second major and just how many people were watching that tuned in i know i was tuned in watching partially for nelly we had we're fortunate to have a couple of our juniors in the field so that was cool to see but um Part of that, for me at least, is crazy to think about, like, our juniors competing on that same level against somebody who is just that skilled, that talented, um, and just right now, frankly, that dominant. Yeah, Yeah, 100%. With the the Rory and Shane Lowry thing, I wanted to talk about that. Do you think that these team wins should count as individual wins? So, like, if you go look at Rory's profile, it counts as a PGA Tour win. What is your – what's your thought on that? 
obviously we there's a lot of people who have a lot of different opinions but just curious we were, t- we were talking about that within the communications department this week and i was just curious see it's it's one of those things thinking about it i don't love it counting as an individual win but it is a win and so like, i don't know where else you put that yeah. are we going to have a separate category now and be like, oh, well, he has a team win here. Um, is that where, obviously, you count Ryder Cups and President's Cup for guys? You talk about how they're a winning member of that team, but this is a little different since you're just on a two-man team kind of competing there. So, Do you count the PNC? See, that's what there's a – I feel like there's Pebble, just a Pebble very, Beach. A very niche category of its own <laughs> where you, you do count them, but it's – I think if you, little asterisk it, next to if you looked at a guy had 40 wins that were all teams, I think that's when you start to question it. I think when right. you just kind of sprinkle right. a couple in here and there, I don't know if anyone's going to get too upset about it. I think if you do, you're probably just on the internet looking for something to get upset about. You're an internet troll. Which, I mean, I feel like that's that's half of golf online. Right. Right. People being mad that they're not that good. Right. right? Uh, which is, I feel like, where a lot of that stems from is guys just coming in again. They're like, oh, I won my scrambles. Do I get this? Credit? It's like, the answer's no, you don't. So chill out. But uh, it is a good question. Something I hadn't really thought about, but not really sure where else you would put him. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Um, and then we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Miles Russell. Uh, just incredible. Um, the, he played in two the two Corn Ferry events, shot. I guess it was what six rounds under par. Um, I made the cut, finished top twenty at um, his first one, and then um, he he missed the cut at the second one, but still fired two rounds of under par there. I mean that's crazy. He's fifteen years old. The kid is just breaking records left and right. Yeah, and it's just the composure that he's shown too. It's he started out. Um, I think it was maybe the second or third round um, of the Veritex where he's. I think he went bogey, double bogey. So he's four over through three holes, and then he still finished, what, six under par that day? Yeah. Um, so it's just the ability to bounce back. You know, that's one of those things I feel like separates um, the grid from the great golfers um, is just that bounce back ability. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see that when you get into trouble, you know, how are you going to recover from that? And it would have been very easy for him to just cash it in and finish the round. There it was. I blew up. The run's yeah. over. but. Got my no, experience, he, got out. Totally. Yeah, he's, he sticks by it. Um, and I think he was one over on the front. I think he shot 36 on the, or 37, pardon me, on the front that day and then comes back and, again, just gets on a heater on the back nine um, and has another great round. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to get him um, on the pod here in the next few episodes with get his schedule lined up. But, you know, speaking of, of Miles, he was obviously a Rolex Junior Player of the Year last year on the boys' side. On the girls' side, we have Yana Wilson. So um, we're going to, you know, chat with her and kind of get to know her a little bit more. I have a few questions for her. So, um, Yana, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're going to just kind of ask a bunch of questions about your year. Last year, obviously, being player of the year is pretty awesome, and you've been doing some really cool stuff at some really cool events since then. So um, I'll just kind of kick it off with just the the big one, I think, um, being player of the year. Like, what was what did that mean to you just uh, last year being Rolex Junior Player of the Year? Um, obviously, it means a lot. I've looked up to so many uh, Rolex Junior Player of the Years. Um in the past couple of years, like I think NB Park was one. And then obviously Rose Zhang doing some cool things um, on our rookie year on tour. Um, but it's honestly such a huge honor and just a huge boost of confidence knowing that I played well last year um, heading into this year. And it was a pretty tight race coming down to the wire for the player of the year. Did you go into those tournaments kind of knowing where you had to finish or was it something where you just kind of tried to keep it out of the mind and just let the game speak for itself? No, I knew I had to play well. Um, my parents were kind of on me about it too. Like I remember playing the AJGA girls and they're like, Yona, if you don't win this, you're not going to win player of the year. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I worked really hard though. And um, it was definitely one of the most nerve-wracking stretch of months just knowing I had to play good and I couldn't really mess up but um it really showed a lot about my character I think and I learned a lot about myself um just knowing that I can perform under pressure um when I really have to so yeah there was uh certainly some some tight ones that you were in um what was your favorite memory or I don't know event from last year this one that really sticks out to you I think Mizuho, uh, just because we got to play alongside the pros. Um, it's really hard for like juniors or amateurs to get into like professional events. So I think that was really special. 
Um, but Says the girl that just finished this, played in an LPGA <laughs> major. <laughs> it is hard. I mean, I got in last minute, but it is hard. Um, but yeah, I think that tournament is really special just because I got to learn. I wasn't even really worried about playing well. Um, I just really wanted to learn from the girls I were I was playing with, and I had some good pairings. Um, I was paired with my favorite player, Minji Lee. Um, Cheyenne Knight for two days, and she played so well. And I learned a lot from their games. And why don't you walk us through a little bit of what that week looks like from AJJ player perspective? Um, obviously, since it's a little bit of a different format for you. Yeah. Um, so start of the week, we get our practice rounds, and I think the practice rounds are probably one of the coolest because you just show up to the tee and you can play with you know whoever you want, whoever's at the tee. So last year, I had my practice round with Yuli Mino, and I learned a lot from her, and she didn't end up going to college and I kind of asked her about that because kind of leaning I guess going to college maybe maybe not but um I got some insight from her and I think the practice rounds are pretty cool um just because you get to play with whoever you want and then the first two rounds um still stroke play but you play with uh two I think I think they pair us up in threesomes maybe four I don't know but they pair us up in I think it was threesomes last year and uh two rounds of stroke play and then basically whoever is at the top of the LPGA leaderboard and whoever's at the top of the AJGA leaderboard kind of get paired together and I think that was really cool so yeah, you. Um, how was how was it having Michelle Wee West as a, a tournament ho? Talk about that experience. I mean, it was super cool. She's kind of been like a mentor to me ever since. I'm actually seeing her tomorrow night because we're flying to yeah. New York. So, um, she's she's been awesome. You know, we've been like texting back and forth, kind of. She lives in Vegas now, which is actually super cool. I feel like everybody's moving here, but um, I haven't gotten to see her yet. But we we've been talking about it for a while now, and. Um, I think it's just really cool to have somebody that's as young as her and like you can kind of relate to her and she's done so many things. So I think um, it's really special to have a relationship with her. Yeah, I mean, she's one of those players I know personally growing up watching her get that start at the John Deere Classic. That was something that was super cool for me close to home and got to go see her. So now to see her progress to where she's at and just be giving back to the game is pretty cool. But um, just one of many, I feel like you, Viana, have been fortunate to get the chance to interact with a lot of LPGA professionals, whether it be through hosting AJJ events or making those professional starts. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about those interactions and um, what that kind of means to you having those opportunities? Yeah, last year, um, Michelle kind of paired us up. I think it was Michelle. She paired us up and she kind of gave us like a uh, big sister for the week. At Mizuho, and last year I had Andrea Lee, and um, her and I have been, you know, also texting. And I saw her lot or two weeks ago at Chevron, and um, she's just one of the nicest people I have ever met. Like, especially being an LPGA pro, you know, like some of them are super competitive and just focused, but she's just so down to earth and super cool. Um, so I mean, pretty much every one of the LPGA players I have met is has been like that, and it's honestly super cool to see that somebody at such a high level can um kind of give back to the game because they were once you know juniors too so i think that was pretty cool yeah andrea lee former rolex junior player of the year yep yeah nice little pairing there's so <laughs> many there's so many i know, I know. There, there's a lot you know we were just talking about track. yeah we were talking about the, the pj tour and some of that stuff on the last last podcast so that's really really cool no, very cool. You mentioned before living out in Las Vegas, you're going cross country in New York. You've gotten a chance to play a lot of places across the country. Um, what are some of your favorite places you've gotten to play? Liberty National is definitely going to be a top five favorite for me just because you, you literally get the whole view of like the city right there. And I think that's just like unlike any other course I've played. Um, obviously, Augusta National is at the top of my list. There it is. I was waiting for yep. it. <laughs> How could it not be? How could it not be? Um, and then I would probably say Pebble Beach because I played, I played that one last year in the U.S. Women's Open, and I just love views and I love the ocean, so it just tied together. So that's probably my second favorite. Um, let me think. We played our Robert Trent Jones in uh, Virginia. I think he was in 2021, 
I really love it there. It was Rolex so Girls, I think, right? Yes, Rolex Girls. It was unreal. Like, the wedge range was just insane. Like, I think you guys should really move the tournament back there, and I'm hoping you do. <laughs> for the future. I'll let people know. But, <laughs> yes, please. Because I, I mean, yeah, I, it's just such a nice course. And um, amazing practice facilities, and you also get the view of, like, the water over there, and it's just so pristine. Um, Realize I'm hearing a lot of water views. <laughs> yeah, so I'm guessing you're really a beach like, girl then, not a mountain yeah. beach, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's a good like thing you're out in the Vegas desert. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I would say pretty much any course on the beach, I would, I would love. So. <laughs> Speaking of Vegas and the desert, you volunteered at an AJJ event last year. I think the seniors event, right? Yes. You were yes, a timing so station volunteer and a couple other places. What was it like being on the other side? Um, it was it was actually a lot easier. I think. Actually, hold on. No, yeah, I I think it was a little bit easier. Um, I was a water. I was I was kind of this distributing waters here and there. So I think that was pretty hard because you got to like make sure nobody is dehydrated nobody can be dehydrated out there the players are number one it's on you if they are it's on me and you know i i think i did the front nine first and just made sure all the coolers were filled and by the time i got to 10 it was like almost empty and i almost gave myself a heart attack i was like oh (laughs) this cannot be on me (laughs) i know i I was because it was a starting hole too so it was scary but um yeah i honestly the job is not easy, for sure. So I really admire you guys that, <laughs> that do it. All the AJGA volunteers and um, whoever does it's just insane. It's it's a lot of work. We'll say you may have been too. may have been more one of the more recognizable volunteers because I think one of the funniest moments of that week was you driving by the starting tee, handing somebody a water, and they walk up to the tee, do a double take, and they just look and like, was that kind of listen? <laughs> They're like, wait a minute. They're like, hold on. I, I remember somebody telling me that, and I was like, that's so funny. Hey, <laughs> like, you're a celebrity out there. Group. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. But <laughs> <laughs> just a water girl. Just a water girl. <laughs> that's so, awesome. That was, yeah, that was a ton of fun. Well, no. Um, you got the chance to start out there, too. And uh, you just jumped right out there, started those groups. I mean, obviously, it's probably a super cool moment for them as well knowing that you've accomplished but um like you said was it a little bit different being on that side of it were there any nerves being up there being one announcing rather than hitting the tee shot yeah i think i'd actually rather be hitting the tee shot than announcing (laughs) because i don't want to butcher their names um but yeah i was definitely more nervous um announcing you know their hometown and uh, i don't i don't remember but i think one kid might have had like a tongue twistery name and i was like oh i don't want to mess up (laughs) <laughs> that is one I will say that is one of the harder jobs at an AJJ event is being a starter for some some of those names it's it's a challenge I'll just say that yeah you guys do pretty well though I mean you guys never mess up my name so uh. I think that's a lot <laughs> we've got some practice it's, okay. <laughs> it's the whole the whole thing is confidence if you announce anything with confidence then at least everybody except for the person thinks you did it right because you were confident, confident about it yeah, you exactly. wouldn't believe some of like the horror stories we have of people just like butchering names and just stumbling all over themselves and that's oh pretty funny gosh. It's be I, I believe it yeah <laughs> yeah exactly. for real i believe it <clears throat> That was so. That was last year, kind of all that stuff that you did last year. This year, you had some really cool opportunities as well. Um, you know, was that Sage or Anwa or you know even the Chevron, which you played in here a couple weeks ago. What uh, What's been the kind of the standout moment for you of twenty twenty four? That's a hard one. I feel like they're all pretty pretty equal. I mean, playing in a major is is really huge, but also playing at Augusta is also really cool. Um, I don't know. I feel like those two are kind of equal for me. I didn't play my best in both of them, so I don't really, I don't really know. But I think playing with the pros was um, always it's it's always uh, something I can learn from, and you know, I still I still learned a lot from both those tournaments. And um, just being at Augusta and uh, being there for the fifth year, because I I did drive chip and putt for two years and then Anwa that that was my third year and um it never gets old you know you gotta go just walk the course and 
eat some good food. They have really good food and cheap food. And it's so good. Um, Here it is, Thomas. I think that's, 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 that's the best food. part. <laughs> That's the best part, I think. So, what's your favorite? What's your favorite food item then at, at Augusta? Since since we you brought the topic up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My go-to. Um, I really like the egg salad sandwich. Um, I get a couple it's underrated. sandwiches. Yeah, it is for sure. But I get like maybe two or three sandwiches. So then I'd probably go with like pimento cheese because it's pretty good. The pulled yeah, pork yeah. one's not bad either, because I think they have a pulled pork sandwich. I think the pulled Moon pork pie. one is my favorite. Yeah, it's it's really good. I think my my dad, he used to get all the sandwiches and mix them all up and then just like suicide them and then. <laughs> that's a season. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know if that's the most genius thing I've ever heard or the most disgusting. Well, that's, thing a guy who's, that's a guy who's been to Augusta five times and he's like, "How can I spice this up?" <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but like. <laughs> Um, yeah, he, he does that, but, um, I'd say those sandwiches and then probably a couple moon pies, um, Arnold Palmer, there is unbeatable. They really get a lot of practice in, you know, making it. So, uh, it's so good. They make it so perfect every time. I always prefer a little bit more lemonade than iced tea. So they get it right. I, I secretly think they bring in Chick-fil-A lemonade because the really? lemonade is really good. I, I don't think they do. I'm just uh, in my head. That's what I think because it's yeah, so maybe. good there, and that yeah, makes yeah. a huge difference. Just an insider it's secret. So <laughs> yeah, with all my insider knowledge. Did you just blow up the whole operation? There? <laughs> just watch Augusta National like, call you a couple times. <laughs> yeah, this podcast is gonna get canceled Uh-oh. here. <laughs> but, uh, but obviously, super cool starts to the year with all those things you've gotten to do. What are some of the things you're most looking forward to in the coming year? And, I don't have that many events that I know I'm for sure playing. Um, possibly Wyndham Cup this year. It's got probably one of my favorite team events ever. Um, go West. But, um, yeah, I Wyndham Cup has, like, taught me how to play match play. I think I was 14 when I first played Wyndham Cup, so this will be my fourth year. And um, that'd be really cool if I went. I think it's in John's Island. South Carolina? Yeah, my home state. Yeah. Oh, you're you're an East fan. I am a unbiased <laughs> fan. I do not unbiased. have allegiances. Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It's um, <laughs> and then um I think what do I have? I have a US Open qualifier coming up. Um also in it's in New Jersey. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm playing the Evian. Uh, thanks to the AJGA because the Bullock's Girls Player of the Year, I guess, gets that. And that, that'll that be super cool. Um, I've never really been to that far, part of France before. So um, that'll be really exciting. And then the U.S. Amateur in Oklahoma. You may rack it up the miles. miles. I know. It never gets, it never gets old. I, I'm always traveling. Yeah, and you uh, alluded a little bit to the team golf again. I know from Wind Cup, Swan Cup, some of those other things you mentioned, that team golf. Um, what is it about team golf that makes it special and is just so exciting for you? Well, I feel like golf is just such an individual sport. And um, I mean, honestly, I, I like it being an individual sport, but sometimes it can get, you know, kind of lonely out there. So I think just having um, other other people that'll support you like through thick and thin and you kind of go through those ups and downs together I think that's um really important just to kind of gain that knowledge and experience um just for life I guess just to know that there's people like always supporting you no matter what okay I think that's all the questions about your year so let's go into some kind of general questions so how did you get started in golf my dad played golf. Well, he he picked it up at a like in his mid twenties, I think, and he got pretty good at it. And my dad would always leave to the range, like when I was little, and just go hit balls. And I wanted to know where he went, so I like asked him. I was like, "Dad, can you take me?" He's like, "No, you'll be too loud." Like, "No, I'm not. <laughs> you're not going." <laughs> and then um, he finally took me one day because he got tired of me asking. And I was just, I had a, he bought me a big bucket of balls, like maybe a hundred balls. And I was just sitting there and I was quiet, but I did not hit one ball. Like I did not hit (laughs) one of those hundred balls. I don't think I hit one of them. 
And so he he just saw me kind of like not really give up. And um, he just kind of saw me just trying to like work my way through that bucket. And I guess he was like, oh, maybe this is something she could be interested in because um, I wasn't getting like too mad or frustrated or anything. He just, he, expect, he expected a lot worse of me, I think. Um, but yeah, and that's kind of how I got started. And then um, as time went on, he put me in tournaments. I lost pretty bad. Um, for like a good bit of time, maybe like two or three years, I kept getting my butt kicked and I, I didn't like it because I'm very competitive. And so um, he's kind of just worked with me ever since and he's kind of been my coach. Um, and yeah, now we're here. No, it's got to be a cool bond that you guys have. Um, certainly yeah. something that he was passionate about to see his daughter get so interested in. Um, but I always see him out at the events always on the first tee, right before you tee off. Do you guys have any kind of little rituals or anything that you do before every round? Um, not really together. He'll just kind of watch me on the range, see how I'm hitting it. And then um, he's mainly before the rounds, he's not like too hard on me on like whether I'm hitting it good or bad. He's like, okay, you got what you got. Just like go out there and kill it. Like I know you can do it. Um, he kind of just gives me like those positive like pep talks before my round and, um no but I would just say like before the tournament even starts like we just practice together on uh track man and just like fundamentals making sure my swing is good um nothing too crazy we asked Jasmine this question on the last podcast but um when let's go ahead and get a prediction on when you think your first LPGA win is going to be Oh, she no. she told us she told us the end of 2026. So she was uh, being very aggressive. But curious your thoughts there. We well, want to come honestly, back to this, you know, down the road. <laughs> honestly, when I was 12 years old, I thought I would have already had an LPGA win by now. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I would like to get one by. I I would say before 20. Maybe during the year of 2026 or maybe even before it. Sounds like we're just going to be loaded up in 2026. <laughs> yeah. You and Jasmine know. just battling it out at the top every week. I mean, hey, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. She's been playing so good recently. Uh, what is your, what's your go-to food, your go-to type of food? If you're going to pick a restaurant, what, what genre is it in? Mm, lately, I've been craving a lot of Thai food. Like, I've been eating that every other day. It's so good. But anything, almost any kind of Asian food. I love Korean food. I love sushi. I love Thai food. I I love any kind of food. I'm not picky at all. <laughs> I love any kind of food. Seriously. See, that just seems like a theme in the golf community. Is, <laughs> yeah. Again, everyone, everyone we've talked to, talked to it, it just circles, circles back to the food. food. No matter where we try to go, it just always comes right back. They're like, we're like, oh, what are your favorite golf courses? And we're like, well, the food at this place is really good, and the food at this place is really good. I, I really think that's the deciding fact. Forget the grass. It's all about the food. Yeah, definitely. I think we're going to have a spinoff AJJ podcast that's just yeah, AJJ movies. Sweet. We're just going to go around <laughs> rating the food at every golf course. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> I know. After, after I signed with Little Woman, my – my my dad kind of made this joke and he was like you know how like min woo is like let her let him cook my dad was like you should be let her eat or whatever and i was like <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a massive dad joke um, that, like, that i don't think you could have a bigger j- dad joke than that but that also needs to happen <laughs> like he's spot on with that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How was that photo shoot? Was that fun doing it kind of alongside him? And I know you've done a couple now um, with different entities with TaylorMade and, and stuff like that. So what's what are those photo shoots like? Are they long days or is it fun? Yeah, it was super cool. I think this is like the longest one I've ever done. It was maybe like five to seven hours ish long. And it was like raining and cold the whole time. But it was, I didn't even really care because um, you know, I was right next to Min Woo Lee, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And he was, he was super cool. He wasn't even like, he, he's just such a down to earth person and, um, really funny. And I think he's just such like a normal guy, but like 
he's so good at golf too. So like, it's just, <laughs> it's hard to believe. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but he's awesome. Um, I feel like that's why people like him so much is he just seems like so relatable and just like the average guy. Like, like people yeah, just look at him and they're like, Oh, I can be like that guy. <laughs> like if that guy, can call, I can probably, go call. <laughs> probably not, but close enough. <laughs> He's just, I think he was my favorite. He he just became like my favorite PGA Tour player just from that one interaction. He's just super cool. What, as we kind of wrap up here a little bit, what is uh, some advice that you would have for someone who's just getting started with junior golf and kind of the AJGA? And obviously you've been around for what, four or five years with different tournaments and things. What would you say to somebody who's just getting started with the AJGA? Um, Oof. That's a tough question. Taking you down memory lane here a little bit. Uh, yeah, I remember when I first started AJGA, I was not the best player by all means. Like, I it took me maybe a couple years to learn how to play against you know some of the top juniors in the country. Um, so I would say just stay patient. It's probably my biggest piece of advice that I would give. Um, just stay patient and um. Think. this is hard i actually love that because i was i was thinking about um like i actually looked up scotty scheffler finished t40 in his first event that he played at the ajj out of like 60 kids and there, there's a number of big stars in pro golf right now who's who did not play well in their first few events i think wyndham clark was really did not play well in his first few events uh, patrick Cantlay. so uh, it's really interesting to see the progression and I love that you know stay patient and kind of stay focused on on just the next tournament and getting better and better and the other stuff will come exactly I think that's really the main thing you got to focus on because it's kind of a big jump um just playing from kind of like small local tours and then kind of jumping towards the AJGA and you're suddenly playing against like you know all these kind of big name juniors that you've um that you've been watching for like the longest time. I think that that can be hard to like adjust to sometimes, but you just really have to play your own game and just um, believe in what you practice in and things will go your way. Eventually it might not be right away, but um, things will always work out if you just stay patient, I guess. Yeah. No, I feel like um, you mentioned you're, you're a competitor, so it's easy to get down yourself, but it seems like throughout your time with the AJG, it's, there's been a lot of positivity, whether it's towards yourself, towards the other juniors. I know Jasmine mentioned that, you know, she's walking down the fairway of 18 and you're just kind of keeping things light. You're ready to celebrate with her. So um, glad to see you keep it light. I feel like it's very easy to kind of get away from that um, because like I said, at the end of the day, it is a game. So um, we hope that you can go out there and have that kind of fun on the course. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the most important things is having fun because if you're having fun, then if you're not having fun, then it's just like pointless, you know, but obviously everyone wants to win. Um, I know all the girls out there are very competitive and I am too, but um, I think um, just having fun is probably number, number one. And it also help you play good too. Cause I think if you're down on yourself all the time, like, especially when you're playing, it's hard to play good. Um, in golf, you need to be positive and just keep your head light as much as you can. Because um, golf is not a game of perfect. And if you expect it to be a game of perfect, then oh, it's going to be tough. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that's definitely what I would do, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's always good to have something to strive for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I'll just say slightly above, above average. average. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned Annika a little bit before, kind of as you were talking about that. Um, do you have like you have a golf idol that you really look up to, um, or some someone who um, you kind of try to really model what you're doing after? Yeah, obviously Annika. I think she'd be number number one for me because she's the goat, and um, the just the way she carries herself. I saw her at Augusta National, talked to her a little bit, and. Um, She's just so down to earth with, you know, everything that she's done and her family is great. I know her husband, Mike, really well. And um, she's just somebody really cool to have um, kind of there supporting you. Um, I would say her. Um, let me think. Hmm. 
Nelly Cord is doing some really cool things right now. I haven't I haven't met her yet. Like but, winning. <laughs> yes, I think I think it's unreal what she's doing. Like it's it's insane. So I've been kind of setting her game lately, just seeing how she plays these golf courses and just um, going out and kind of practicing uh, the way she kind of plays now. Um, I would say she's probably. Um, somebody i'm kind of just trying to model my game after right now just because she's killing it so awesome well yana we appreciate you taking the time to come on with us today it's been a lot of fun um obviously wish you a lot of success throughout the rest of the year and kind of in those next stages for you we've really enjoyed having you um as a junior and kind of some all the all the different ways you've impacted the ajj so we appreciate that yeah thank you so much for having me it was fun perfect well thank you very much yana like you said We'll be rooting you on from here. So best of luck coming up at Mizuho and look forward to watching you here down the line. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, thanks, Yana. We'll, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. But thanks to Yana for coming on. Just another great guest, just a super successful one of our juniors, but such a great person. She comes out. She's volunteered for us. She's really looking forward to giving back and um, just super excited to see where her game takes her throughout her career. Yeah, totally awesome. Really cool to have her out volunteering at that event and player of the year. Just really cool all around uh, good junior there. So uh, she mentioned Annika being kind of a role model of hers. And uh, Stephen Hamlet, our executive director, has kind of a story about her. And obviously she's had a huge impact on junior golf, and especially girls golf, through her event and through many other ways. So uh, we'll let Stephen take it away. So Thomas and uh, Tim, thank you for having me on. I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share some stories, AJGA stories with you. Uh, one of my favorite people in golf is Annika Sorenstam. And I have so much respect for her, not only as a player, but as a person who wants to give back to the game. And she certainly did that by endowing an ACE grant. Uh, early on, we, we started an Annika Invitational. I was so impressed that first year with all that Annika did for the young ladies. She was everywhere. Every day she was out there and final day hold, holding the flag stick for every single group and giving them a hug and a handshake. And But I remember doing uh, some media training or she was doing some media training with the girls and she pretended that she was the reporter and then gave the girls tips on how to uh, do an interview, which I thought was phenomenal. And then at her clinic, she talked about pace of play and how she had worked real hard uh, and real focused on her pre-shot routine. And she said, I, I got my pre-shot routine down to 28 seconds. I thought, man, that's just 28 seconds. Uh, and she said, because I knew if we ever got timed as a group, I would never get a penalty because I knew what my routine was. I'd go into my routine and it would be 28 seconds. I thought that was really interesting from here's this world-class player that's even thought about a pre-shot routine, getting it to a point uh, where she was never going to be in jeopardy of getting a penalty. Great lesson for the young ladies, for sure. Thanks, Stephen. Um, really enjoyed being able to have him on the last couple episodes. Looking forward to seeing what other stories he has, just years and years of them. But great to hear about a person like Annika, who's had so much professional success, but hasn't made that what's defined her career. It's that she's very committed to giving back to the junior community as well, just like a lot of our other tournament hosts. And we've got a lot of great tournament hosts out there. So I'm really glad to see that they're willing to use their platform to give back to that next generation of golf. Yeah, I think that's really important and something that um, I think a lot of these juniors are going to start to do even more as as they get impacted by the AJHA and kind of come back to the junior golf days a little bit once they turn professional and, and really see some of that success out there. So that's, that's kind of all we had for today. So we definitely appreciate everybody tuning in and listening. Again, if you have any questions or anything that you want us to cover or talk about, you can DM us on social media. Our handle is AJGA Golf, and that's going to be on X, on Instagram, on Facebook, Facebook, on LinkedIn, all of the channels. So uh, definitely shoot those over to us. We're going to work on some mini episodes answering a few of those questions. Um, so shoot those over to us. But we appreciate you tuning in. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks, guys.